Welcome to the Westport Library. Today's program will begin momentarily. Supported by Verso Studios. Created locally and shared with the world. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Panels and Gutters, the comic art of Rowan McCall and Connor McCann. Um, this program is especially exciting tonight because it officially kicks off our 2023 StoryFest weekend. Um, StoryFest is Connecticut's largest literary festival that celebrates storytelling in all its forms across all mediums, as we can see here tonight. My name is Carrie. I'm part of the programming team here, and I am filling in tonight for our exhibit curator, Carol Ergerfass, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. When Carol and the team were planning this exhibit and thinking about how best to incorporate visual storytelling into our festival, cartoon illustration and graphic novels seemed like an obvious choice, especially since our keynote speaker tomorrow night, Neil Gaiman, has authored over 30 of them. Lucky for all of us, one of our moderator, Catherine Ross's many hats, is library exhibit committee member. And she suggested Rowan and Connor, two of her former art students, back when they were both students at Staples High School, um, who were both well on their way to successful comic careers of their own. We thought it would be great to feature these two young artists who could not only show their work, but could also talk to the trials and tribulations of making it in the field of comics today. So we reached out, and here we are. Rowan McCall is based in a tiny studio apartment in Queens, New York. She was born and raised in Westport, graduating Staples in 2014, and the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, in 2018. Since then, she has been involved in various anthologies, art fairs, and publishing graphic novels. Her latest graphic novel, Who Was Accused in the Salem Witch Trials, Tichaba, with Penguin Random House, was published this September. Rowan loves cats, fairy tales, and drawing voluminous historical outfits. Connor McCann is based in Brooklyn, New York, also a Westport native, Staples uh, class of 2014, and RISD grad class of 2018. His critically acclaimed graphic novel, God Bless the Machine, was published and distributed internationally by Strangers Publishing in 2021, and the highly anticipated follow-up will be released this fall. He loves Peter Bruegel paintings, vinyl toys, and falling asleep standing up. <laughs> Our moderator tonight, Westport artist Catherine Ross, has been teaching art for about 20 years, privately and as an artist in residence. She's been involved in many hands-on projects in Westport Public Schools, has co-chaired the Art Smarts program, and runs workshops at local arts organizations and schools across Fairfield County. Catherine is a member of the Artist Collective of Westport and has been involved in many other town arts organizations, including Arts Advisory, the Cultural Arts Committee, and the Westport Arts Center, among many others. We want to thank the library's amazing volunteer art committee for helping with everything from planning exhibits to hanging the artwork to hosting the reception tonight. And the library's AV team, David and Travis, for recording tonight's presentation, which will be available on our website after the event. And last but not least, before I introduce our guest tonight, be sure to check out the rest of our StoryFest lineup. Um, the full lineup is on our website. We have these little guys hanging around the library. If you see that, you can check out. We have um, panels and workshops all weekends. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Rowan, Connor, and Catherine to the stage. Hi. Ooh. <laughs> Hello. I have never heard myself at a microphone before. Vaguely terrifying, but everything about this is. We're all terrified yeah, together. We're all terrified. Um, welcome and thank you all for coming. Um, and thanks to the Westport Library for this incredible space to celebrate art and the art of storytelling. Um, I'm Catherine Ross, and you heard, um, I've, but so you know my stuff. But I have the, I'm so excited to introduce Connor 
and Rowan. I first met you both as high school students. You came to my studio for art lessons and for college portfolio prep, fun days. Um, and then you went on to RISD, and now you're professional art makers. And I would like to take credit for all of their success. <laughs> but they did come to me incredibly talented and also dedicated. And that's a great combo, to be talented and be dedicated. So um, together you chose the title for this show. Can you tell us non-comic people what it means, one of you? Um, so panels are the boxes that make up a page of comics, and then gutters are the space in between those boxes. So it's kind of just like a little wink and a nod to two industry terms, and you know, we're talking about the process, we're getting into it. So it just felt apt for this exhibit. And we really kind of really wanted to focus on like this, we, focus on the storytelling and storytelling art, which is, ulti it's, if you're going to point to anything that's like the sentence and words of comics that are panels and gutters. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we're gonna start with you, Connor, and we're gonna begin with some of your early work at RISD. Um, this particular one seems like it came from an emotional time in your life or an event in your life. Was this a class assignment? Yeah, this was my woodblock printing uh, final my sophomore year. I started in illustration and then switched into printmaking, which had more of like a wily entrepreneurial spirit that I related to. Um, and so, yeah, this was about my grandmother having dementia, and I made a book about it, so. So um, with that, what you just said, um, can you explain how your art making helps you process Event, life events? I mean, I think there's something sort of automatic to processing any life event I experience, big or small, through making art, and especially comics, because I'm compulsively making comics, and in turn, I'm like compulsively reflecting back like the trials and tribulations of my life in whatever I make. So, you know, sometimes it's really poignant like that, but sometimes it could be just like um, the experience of having a spider crawl across my laptop <laughs> screen or something. Right. So. Right. So why don't you talk about this picture? <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, so this, this was kind of like the most important part of art school. I did not need to pay all of the money paid for the, the RISD tuition. Uh, my friend Molly, pictured right, is um, she was kind enough to locate a risograph for me, which was this janky Japanese printer that was discontinued in the 80s. Um, but the actual prints it makes are really beautiful and textured. So upon getting this uh, offset printer, I just started, you know, spewing out as many comics as I could. Um, and I think I ended up publishing like uh, 200 or 250 pages of self-published comics over the next, the final two years of RISD. Wow. So. Wow. That is monumental. So. Would you want to talk about this piece? Yeah, so this was um, the first issue of a horror anthology I did called Velvet Coffin. And then, I mean, this, this comic on the right was just a little one-off I did, kind of as a Tumblr bait at the time. Like, it was kind of, I don't know, like made to make people <laughs> like it. And unfortunately, it became like too popular to the point where I really resent it now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's about all I have to say about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember this comic, so yes. <laughs> yeah, it was very popular. Um, and then this was, I think, one of my more successful works at RISD. I spent a whole semester drawing one 24-page comic, um, and it was three interconnected short stories, and I really took my time with it. Um, I mean, it's definitely, like, I cringe looking at it now, but at the time I was happy with it and I think it was successful at the time. Um, okay, so Connor, I hesitate to ask this because your answer may put me out of business, but do you feel that art school was necessary in your case? So I think there are indelible parts of my art making process that I could not have gained had I not gone to art school. But I think anyone, any teenager with internet access and like a good work ethic could 
supersede anything I did at RISD and become the, the greatest artist of their generation if they, if they really wanted to. It's, everything's online. You can make friends easily. It's, it's, it's all there for you. Well, you, I mentioned dedication before, and you just mentioned it like that, too, if, um, if you have the work ethic. I mean, you came to me, and you really had a strong idea of what you were going to be professionally. Were there any classes or um, at school that, like you said, what were the things that you were taught at school and what do you think they should have and would have been more helpful? Um, the things that were most successful in terms of classes I took, one was a photolithography class, which um, that sort of pink tinged print was one of the things I made in that class. And I think that has gone on to inform a lot of the way I use color. And then in terms of just making art, I took a nonfiction class with this great guy named Phil Eel. And um, you know, a lot of compelling nonfiction sort of exists at the edge of reality. You know, it's like kind of uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Right. And I find when I'm like writing fiction, I think about like the credible details that make up like a, an insane person or, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. All right. So. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. My turn. Hi, Rowan. Hi. It's your turn. And while we take in this next few images, I want to ask you, would you recommend art school? So my dad paid, a, my mom and dad paid a lot of money to get me <laughs> to the art school. So I'm going to say yes. <laughs> uh, for, I... I've had friends who had a really hard time in art school. I had a pretty good time. I, re I very much took it as an opportunity to really try different things. I went through so, there was a whole, we, I don't know about printmaking, but illustration had this big emphasis on going to other majors and trying other majors. I think you had to do at least one non-major class per year. So I did a lot of photography, I did a lot of printmaking, I, and a lot of bookmaking, and that actually really, sort of became like fundamentals for a lot of how I view the world and how I view art. And that was always really cool to looking, I don't know if actually cool is the right word. It was always interesting, <laughs> at the very least, looking back on that and seeing how those different inter, inter, um, influences changed me and changed my work. And I don't know how, if I would be able to get that normally, mm. but also hindsight's twenty twenty. I also, I kind of joke that I learned to talk in college. <laughs> <laughs> if you knew me before college, I didn't talk a lot. But now I do. So <laughs> I talk too much, perhaps. Uh, well, that being said, let's go to the next slide. And you, this piece is actually in, in your show mm -hmm. twice, one black and white and, and this one. Both of you did these wonderful process panels that are in there and talked about your process. Can you just quickly... Tell us how you get to concept to color, and what, why do you choose some to have, be black and white and others to be color? This was this is actually very early on, right after college. There was a period where I just basically was like giving myself deadlines so I have reasons to work. <laughs> it was like there was like a kind of burnt out feeling right after, after college, and sort of like, well, I need to build my portfolio. So I tried every two weeks or so to have a new illustration. And this was one of them, hmm. and which kind of gave me a lot of. I work well, that maybe like why I worked well in college because I do like deadlines. I'm, I'm a good workhorse like that. Uh, this one in particular, I had a. This is actually originally was idea was that all the tattoo. This is gonna be like all digital piece, and all the tattoos were gonna be, uh, animated. Like the idea is like they're all like oh this. All the anime, like they're like all wriggling around and all that, uh, and that was too much work. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and it sort of became this. This accidentally ended up being sort of a fundamental piece in my portfolio and my work, and like when I look back upon like to see how I am today. As for what, why say this was colored versus other like black and white. It was mostly because I was trying to get better at color. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. If I didn't have to do color, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> well, this is the segue to, this is another beautiful oh. color one. <laughs> yes, thank and, you. And then you have this one, which you wanted to talk about. So. Yes. Uh, the second one, the one you just showed was, uh, yes, 
that was an experiment in me trying to get back to color because <laughs> I, because let me tell you, uh, I get hired to do color more than I don't. Uh, and so this was actually an experiment in doing very selective colors, like a very selective palette. I think there's only four colors in this whole thing. And it was sort of experiment, it like, that becomes more of experiment in design rather than illustration at that point. And not very fun to talk about, but it's fun to think about for me. <laughs> okay, well let's go to this one here. What would yes. you like to say about this? This is the unicorn girl, the unicorn girl. I actually really like this one because I have a fascination with unicorns. <laughs> Uh, from when I was a kid and to the point where it's like a whole thing for me where I love unicorns because I loved them as a kid because I loved the unicorn tapestries as a kid and that has a weird kind of bouncing on effect about how I actually comp compose illustrations. Uh, so, the, so if you ever seen like unicorn tapestries, which is the famous unicorn in captivity, that's the one I'm thinking about. Uh, it has this very flat, on point, but very detailed. Hmm. Like a lot of details, a lot of, if you actually ever really looked at these illustrations, uh, these tapestries, they're huge by the way, they're beautiful, and there's also so many beautiful detail. And I think we have like, especially because we have this very specific idea about medieval art that's like, that's rudimentary or rough or mm -hmm. bad because the cats look weird right. or the babies look weird, but no, there's a lot of artistry and a lot of thought and interest in put into it. And I'm talking too much, but uh... Well, no, it's very interesting. I could, okay, so Connor. These yeah. are, the next, next images are your recent freelance work. Can you talk about this children's book? So this was, um, I think like the, one of the first big jobs I got right after college was like illustrating this educational children's book about malaria. And these, these people still um, hire me and work with me to this day on various <laughs> projects. Um, but, you know, I feel like this is kind of indicative of the sorts of work you end up doing immediately after art school where it's, like, really not in your ballpark at all. Um, but you have to find a way to make it work and compelling and captivating for yourself. So I still, I still like... Yeah, and yeah. there's definitely some of your trademark stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, it's very, I can very much see the uh, printmaking aspects to it, like the very flat colors with the white highlights and very Those great bugs, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the great mosquitoes. Um, can you speak about the pitfalls of freelance work and the challenges? Uh, um, yeah, we're like looking at one right now. <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, this, creator that I worked with was a lovely guy and he had a lot going on and um, I spent a year working on this comic and it hasn't come out but he paid me well so that's well, um, that's something more. that I can say positively about this experience and these are two pages that I spent <laughs> weeks on um, <laughs> but yeah I feel like every new artist has that project of like when you don't have any room to say no to projects. So I was like, oh, you give me money? Sure, yeah. I'll do it. Right? Yeah, and sometimes the headache is like commensurate to the amount of money you're being paid. Um, and that was one of those times. This is a band merch I did for Cherry Glazer, a sort of like indie rock band. Um, I saw them play at Webster Hall shortly after I drew this design. It was very like surreal to see like just people wearing my shirts just like in droves. Um, great client, 10 out of 10. That's great. <laughs> okay, back to you, Rowan. Um, I have a question here that I wanted to discuss. How has your art and career path changed since you first graduated? When I first graduated college, I didn't think I'd be going to comics because I didn't think I was very good at them. <laughs> And I never got a lot of attention in school for it. And so I very much was like, you know what? I'm going to be safe. I'm going to illustrate, because that's safer. I'm going to do book illustrations. And I'll just do comics on the main side. Uh, now it's the opposite. <laughs> that was very much the opposite. Wow. Yes. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So is this another piece like as for illustration or... Uh, this was this is like a personal project that mm. was very much this was like one that lived in my my uh, sketchbook for like a year until I was like yeah I'll, I'll I could use something to do for a, for a weekend I can do something to like really focus on 
Uh, this also was one that was really, people really, really liked ended up. Uh, I did a little, I never did a little time lapse of me drawing and people really liked that. I've had multiple people who gotten this as a tattoo. <laughs> wow. Yep. My art will never die. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The magician, right? Yes, this is actually a, a very specific point when I was getting really tired of color, I was getting so frustrated with it. I hated it so much. And so I was like, okay, my personal work, I am gonna like, make the active choice to focus on tone, grayscales, and storytelling. So I started doing this project where I took tarot cards as a sort of in starting place. So this is the magician. Oh, wow. Yes, this is, a, this is the magician, so it's based off the magician as sort of like working off of that vibe. And it sort of like started some of my theolo like this, I really like, my favorite illustrations are the one that feel like they have like a story to them, even mm -hmm. if you never really know it. Yes. Like you can just, with a lot of character, a lot of atmosphere and a lot of suggestions of themes, I suppose. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, oh no. No, oh, I have one more slide, and then I wanted to look at. And this book, which you can buy out in the art, um, the gallery over there, um, it's a beautiful story. And inside is just laid out so beautifully. Thank you. Um, and I was going to, I'm going to ask you this too, because yours is the same. Where did you learn to? the typeface and the layout and how to create a story where you're reading boxes but everybody knows you want that flow so you know what to read next and you're not confused. How, where, did you learn that in school? In theory. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> well, I, I took comic classes. You, I don't know if you did. Uh, well, in it's theory, yes. Turn. <laughs> that is to get very soppy about it, that becomes like a whole thing where I mentioned before, like the language, I feel like paneling is such an underrated part of comics because it's so much the foundation of a comic page hmm. to the point where I could argue like that's almost like the panels and gutters and the layout is a sentence and hmm. you can be as beautiful or stars as you would be in prose in the paneling. And that's really your voice on the, on the end. Of, that's a component of the voice, I suppose. Again, being soppy. Uh, but of how I learned it, it's very much looking at the work I really, really like right. and adapting my voice from there. It's a lot of studying. It's a lot of l not quite studies, but trying to understand why this moment worked, how it did, how the scene worked, how it did, and why it affected me so much. Um, and because like pacing is one of those things, I feel like it's not really something you can learn Exactly, you, like you can't be taught the best way to do like pacing. Anyone who's actually tried, like there's like structures. There's the three three act structures. There's the rising action, falling action. To, but to really learn that, you actually had to do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> which is hard. And, it's... and and every artist has their own style mm -hmm. to it. So everyone has their own voice. Speaking of their own style, <laughs> we're back to you, Connor. <laughs> Yeah, this is just a, another freelance illustration for um, some sort of tech company that asked me to draw children playing on robots, and I still like this one. I do too. Uh, yeah, it's cool. Um, well, I like all your work, but um, okay, another photo that needs explaining. Um, so, I remember this. Yeah, so I'm a wide-eyed 22-year-old recent RISD graduate with uh, no career prospects <laughs> um, at Comic Arts Brooklyn 2018. Um, and I remember this one, like, I barely sold anything, and something that really stuck with me is when people would pick up a comic, they would decide to buy the comic, generally by what was in the middle spread of the book or the first page, um, and that'll come up later, so. Okay. It's like, foreshadowing. Yeah, foreshadowing. <laughs> Yeah, so immediately the foreshadowing pays off. Um, <laughs> so this was kind of like my big breakout success. Um, you know, I'm an indie darling. I'm kissing babies. I'm shaking hands with politicians. Um, God loves you. God loves me. Um, <laughs> but so when I made this book, having all of these humiliating failures as a person in my early 20s really paid off because I could take all of those lessons about book layout 
and then apply them in a more uh, uh, successful way. So for example, this is the middle spread of this book, which you know, even if there is a review of the book where people don't like it, they're like, you know, McCann's really intentional with how he lays out his page. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. And it sold a bunch of copies, and this is the second printing announcement. Congratulations. Yay. OK, back to you, Rowan. Who and what are your artistic influences? And where do your ideas come from? I know you said that you talked about the tapestries and, and that kind of stuff, kind of like, I love fairy tales. I love, I think I've had a friend note, like, point out, like, I really like adapting stories. Because I, I really love theater. <laughs> I love plays, um, so I think that's really that sort of the idea of like the idea of taking a story and reinventing it through your own lens is very interesting to me. Mm. And I think that actually comes with my art a lot because uh, this is also one of this is another tarot card. Tarot card. This is the fool. Uh, when this specifically, this I think I like very much going for this idea of the I, the fool is the beginning of the set. It's the beginning of the story, and the fool can be whoever they want to be. Uh, and I think like it had like these little uh, te like flavor text for these illustrations. I think this one was along the lines of uh, who cares who the fool was before? They have so much more interesting people to be. And I think that's a line I really take to heart a lot of the time, especially when it comes to storytelling. That's the mm. theme that comes up a lot, especially if you read Twigs, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> So I was going to ask you, are, are these, these pieces are mostly for yourself that you're showing in this, this show? Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's always these great stories behind them that just are from other places that you're retelling, or are they from your life too? I'm going to be sappy again. Um, <laughs> there's this idea that the painter can't help but paint themselves. Uh, and so like the idea of like no matter what you create you're, the piece of an artist and their point of view and their vision and their voice will come through No matter what I uh, was just something an idea. I take to heart which again very sappy uh, That's true. Though. Yeah, can't be helped. Yeah, look at this. This, this is this is my most most popular one by far uh, This is the devil by the way the tarot card and not just the devil which I've been accused of online um, <laughs> People get really weird about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, let's go over to Connor. Um, we talked a little bit about um, your work. So when you wake up in the morning and you you live in a, your apartment and your studio is at your apartment, are you disciplined? You come in and you work a certain amount of hours and then you have a social life. Do you have a social life as well? <laughs> I mean, it's hard working, you know, as an artist, you're alone a lot and you're with your art, so. Yeah, I would say I work six days a week um, and I just moved in with my girlfriend, so like, I'm not sure how that's gonna affect stuff, you know, like. <laughs> that's weird. Um, but generally it's six and sometimes six and a half days of working like eight to 12 hours. Wow. And then if I'm nearing like the end of a book, it will like kick up to like 12 to 14. Um, but I, I mean that I like that makes me happy like I if I could do that every day. I would Just be ecstatic um, Yeah This piece is um, in the show and It is a beautiful piece and again we talked about you know working through what you're going through through your art and um, There's just there's not a lot going on, and it says so much. So I just want to congratulate you on that. That's really oh, thank beautiful you. piece. Yeah, this one just like poured out of me like whole cloth in like a, a day and a half, and yeah. Yeah, powerful. Um, did you want to talk about this? That you yeah, did, th right? this is my new book. It's coming out in 2024. Um, and these are, these are just pages from it um, that I'm happy with, and uh, I'm currently tearing out my hair, trying to finish it, and working on it every day, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm up and down every day, I'm crying, I'm laughing, <laughs> I'm, but it's getting done, and, yeah. I have a question, just a personal. What do you think is harder, the beginning of the book or the end of the book? 
Um, I think like the first 25% of the book is really fun and the last 25%, but it's like the middle 50% is like bone crushing at hell. times. It's yeah, hell, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you think? I think I've always, the beginning is always the hardest for me because I'm like, I feel like I'm gonna have to relearn how to draw every time I start a new project. <laughs> yeah, uh, fun, fun, fun. That's interesting because I always feel that the creative process, you have an idea and it's very exciting to start and it's those middle thing where with writing or with with art, it's just, oh, can I get through to, and then you start picking it up at yep. the end. The so. desert of inspiration. Yeah. But that's where Hard I feel work. like the real growth comes from, like finding the section of the book you find most painful and like finding some sort of joy or new like technique or innovation you can do in the medium. Like that's... That's what ultimately where I'm like the most elated when right. working on a project. Right. Yeah, because you can't, true. you can't, it can't look like you were bored drawing this. <laughs> yeah, people can tell when you're not excited about the thing you're drawing. <laughs> you got to find something about it. Okay, Rowan. Um, has living in New York influenced your work? I think it's really nice living alone. Uh, to kind of also kind of like piggyback of his like that question where it's like I also work alone I also I live alone I work alone I work in my tiny studio Queens apartment where I walk uh, about 20 feet to my studio and that's it uh, <laughs> and but it's also it's really I have some friends that live really close by so I've been able to really hang out with them and be with them it's I have family that lives really close by and that's cool I have great food, and also I have museums, and that's really fun. I, I, I take a lot of, I really do, when I have time, I go to the muse, like one of the museums once a week. That's nice. Yeah, because I love history. I love looking at things that kind of, like, and trying inspiration from, like, because a lot of my work's also historically based. Right. So there's, like, a lot of research, and sometimes just, like, so much, sometimes that's just research is just sitting in a room, looking at a thing, and trying to absorb it. Right. <laughs> yes. Right. Tell us about that. Oh yeah, that's the lover's card. <laughs> and it, there's, there's a not zero part of it that came from the fact like I had not dated in a very long time. <laughs> but I also write a lot of romantic stories. Right. And so there was like, that's kind of the point of it. That kind of like, that meant to be the tension of someone who is not very um, satisfied with their own romantic experience and exp um, uh, life while also having, trying to tap into those feelings for their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, right. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think this is actually one of the very, very first pieces I did right out of college. Wow. Um, I think I was going, it's, it's a lot different than my usual work because I was trying to go for a painterly thing, mm -hmm. and I realized I didn't really like doing the painterly thing, but this one turned out nice. Yeah, the composition's wonderful. Um, there's a lot of things we didn't really get into, but I do want to leave room for questions and, um, and anything you want to ask these great artists. Um, do they have to stand over there? I guess if you want to, to be recorded. Be in the spotlight you, of you have, you have to get up. But does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to, uh, to ask of? Uh... Oh, good. Fresh blood. I hope, be nice. <laughs> uh, when did you understand that this would be your life's work? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I always kind of... Intuitively, intuitively was doing it. Um, and then I rem remember being at like a family barbecue after like self-publishing my work in fifth grade and someone was like, like is this what you want to do? Like, is that what you're going to do? And I was like, like yeah, that's, <laughs> like, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> you were so young. You didn't know the, about money. You didn't know about taxes. No, no, I had no idea about any of that. And I, I still kind of don't. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think I had experience when I was a kid, I think like in third grade, where I was like, man, I love writing. Man, I love art. If only I could find a way to <laughs> combine the two alchemically, like Frankenstein. That's not like Frankenstein. Never mind. Um, but I think that, that was like, that was when I was doomed when I realized I could do comics and that could be everything I could in theory like in what I like drawing and like what I write writing. And, and then... I, my fate was sealed, yeah. <laughs> like in a tomb. Right. 
This has been awesome. Thank you both. Um, my question is, how do you measure success as an artist? Do you rely on, you know, how many books are sold, or is it really like an inner satisfaction that you get from what you create? Wow, good question. I try really, really hard to do the inner satisfaction thing. Doesn't always work, yeah. to be perfectly <laughs> honest. I try really hard, like, do, say as I don't, Say, do as I say, don't, not as I do, because sometimes like, I get frustrated when I get a bad review or, sure, yeah. um, or something doesn't do well on social media. I really, I've, I've definitely gotten better about that too as I've grown older and like, have more actual career sex outside of social media. But they, there was a point where, especially because so much of my career was on social media and grew from social media, it felt like a failure every time something, every time something didn't do well. And that's bad. Mm. Mm. That's a bad vibe. Um, so yes, in theory, I tried really hard to focus on what I like and what I like to do and what I get out of the work. Yeah, I think I found that um, when I really try to like isolate myself from any sort of external uh, barometer of success, I just really like try and make things I love. Um, then they end up being like the most successful things I do. Because um, it's genuine. Yeah, yeah, and I think that goes a long way. Like when I think about the work I love by other artists, you can tell that they're just like, I'm making this for me. Like, yeah. Doesn't matter, like, right. yeah. Yeah. So, um, any other questions? Um, okay, it, before oh, we... We got one. Oh, we do, yay. We talked a lot, you talked a lot about the drawing process, but as for writing, how locked in do you, uh, do you make sure your writing is before you start your illustrations? And do you try to leave leeway so that you can change it as you go? And you know, does your writing inform your drawing or does your drawing inform your writing? Uh, I tend, a lot of my uh, freelance work is taking someone's script and making a comic out of it. Uh, for my personal work, though, I tend to be really loose, because I, I tend to, like, what I, what I find works best for me is putting together a, a beat by beat outline and just working off of that, because otherwise I feel very, it feels very stiff to try and to take every, I know some scripts, like, every panel's planned out, um, and, like, down to, like, the very size of it and the beats of it. I never like doing that. I very much like take, uh, basically, me talking out loud in prose form and then trying to make a comic out of it. <laughs> and I find that a lot more fun and a lot more freeing because like each, lot, give me a lot more sense of experimentation and creativity for the process. Yeah, I think I'm a big fan of like, no matter how big the project is, writing the entire first draft of it in one to three days and then just like putting it away for a long time um, because it kind of gives you access to a sort of uh, like unfettered creativity where you're not really bound by uh, the practicality of what you're writing. And then when it comes time to like really cut apart that draft and make something more concise, um, a lot of the like the good juicy bits are there, you know, and you just have to refine them and, you know, take that sort of uh, craftsmanship part of making comics and make it compelling and concise. Does that writing that you're doing, is it still an outline or are you putting in the dialogue as well and writing it like a stage play or like? It's kind of like a movie script, yeah. but um, I'm also thinking about what comic specific, like uh, technical tools I can add. So, you know, maybe there's, I, I've not done this, but like maybe there's a character whose word balloons are all backwards or, um, you know, they speak in Comic Sans or, you know. You know, maybe they're really annoying and they speak in Comic Sans. Um, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before, we wrap, oh, before we wrap this up, is there any point or takeaway that we didn't talk about that you two would like to share? Make comics. Comics are fun. Make comics. And buy comics. Buy, buy, comics. buy our comics. <laughs> buy Rowan's comics. Buy my comics. Right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all. Yes, thank you for having us here. Yeah, yeah.